Hey, 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 squirrels! No lipstick. We ain't brewing about it's bedtime again. <laughs> I couldn't take any more. And I should have known. I know what I knew what reanimator was about. I don't know what I was thinking. So we're switching to Edgar Allan Poe in the oblong box, which I have never read. I hope it's good. It's not real long. Some years ago, I engaged passage from Charleston, South Carolina to the city of New York in the fine packet ship Independence, Captain Hardy. We were to sail on the 15th of the month, June, weather permitting, and on the 14th, I went on board to arrange some matters in my stateroom. I found that we were to have a great many passengers, including a more than usual number of ladies. <clears throat> On the list were several of my acquaintances, and among other names, I was rejoiced to see that of Mr. Cornelius Wyatt, a young artist for whom I entertained feelings of warm friendship. He had been with me, a fellow student at C. University, where we were very much together. He had the ordinary temperament of genius and was a compound of misanthropy, sensibility, and enthusiasm. To these qualities, he united the warmest and truest heart which ever beat in a human bosom. I observed that his name was carted upon three staterooms, and upon again referring to the list of passengers, I found that he had engaged passage for himself, wife, and two sisters, his own. The staterooms were sufficiently roomy, and each had two berths, one above the other. These berths, to be sure, were so exceedingly narrow as to be insufficient for more than one person. <coughs> Still, I could not compre comprehend why there were three staterooms for these four persons. I, I was just at that epoch in one of those moody frames of mind <clears throat> which makes a man abnormally inquisitive about trifles. And I confess with shame that I busied myself in a variety of ill-bred and preposterous conjectures conjectures about this matter of the supernumerary stateroom. It was no business of mine, to be sure, but with none the less pertinacity did I occupy myself in attempts to resolve the enigma. At last I reached a conclusion which wrought in me great wonder why I had not arrived at it before. It's a servant, of course, I said. What a fool am I, or I am, not, not sooner to have thought of so obvious a solution. And then I again repaired to the list, but here I saw distinctly that no servant was to come with the party, although in fact it had been the original design to bring one, for the words and servant had been first written and then overscored. Oh, extra baggage, to be sure, I now said to myself. Something he wishes not to be put in the hold. Something to be kept under his own eye. Ah, I have it, a painting or so. And this is what he's been bargaining about with Nicolino, the Italian Jew. This idea satisfied me, and I dismissed my curiosity for the nonce. Why, it's two sisters I knew very well, and most amiable and clever girls they were. His wife, he had newly married, and I had never yet seen her. He had often talked about her in my presence, however, and in his usual style of enthusiasm. He described her as of surpassing beauty, wit, and accomplishment. I was therefore quite anxious to make her acquaintance. On the day in which I visited the ship, the 14th, Wyatt and party were also to visit it. So the captain informed me, and I waited on board an hour longer than I had designed in hope of being presented to the bride. But then an apology came. Mrs. W. was a little indisposed and would decline coming on board until tomorrow at the hour of sailing. 
The morrow having arrived, I was going from my hotel to the wharf when Captain Hardy met me and said that owing to circumstances, and in parentheses, a stupid but convenient phrase, he rather thought the Independence would not sail for a day or two, and that when I was ready he would send up and let me know. This I thought strange, for there was a stiff southerly breeze, but as the circumstances, and quotation marks, were not forthcoming, although I pumped for them with much perseverance, I had nothing to do but to return home and digest my impatience at leisure. I did not receive the expected message from the captain for nearly a week. It came at length, however, and I immediately went on board. The ship was crowded with passengers, and everything was was in the bustle attendant upon making sail. Wyatt's party arrived in about ten minutes. <clears throat> After myself, there were the two sisters, the bride and the artist, the latter in one of his customary fits of moody misanthropy. I was too well used to these, however, to pay them any special attention. He did not even introduce me to his wife. This courtesy, devolving perforce upon his sister Marion, a very sweet and intelligent girl who, in a few hurried words, made us acquainted. acquainted. Mrs. Wyatt had been closely veiled, and when she raised her veil, in acknowledging my bow, I confess that I was very profoundly astonished. I should have been more so, however, had not long experience advised me not to trust, with too implicit a reliance, the enthusiastic descriptions of my friend the artist, when indulging in comments upon the loveliness of, wo of woman. When beauty was the theme, I well knew what facility he soared into the regions of the purely ideal the truth is, I could not help regarding Mrs. Wyatt as a decidedly plain-looking woman, if not positively ugly. She was not, I think, very far from it. She was dressed, however, in exquisite taste, and then I had no doubt that she had captivated my friend's heart by the more enduring graces of the intellect and soul. She said very few words and passed at once into her stateroom with Mr. W. My old inquisitiveness now returned. There was no servant. That was a settled point. I looked, therefore, for the extra baggage. After some delay, a cart arrived at the wharf with an oblong pine box, which was everything that seemed to be expected. Immediately upon its arrival, we made sail and in a short time were safely over the bar and standing out to sea. The box in question was, as I say, oblong. It was about six feet in length by two and a half in breadth. I observed, in a, I observed it attentively and liked to be precise. Now, this shape was peculiar, and no sooner had I seen it that I took credit to myself for the accuracy of my guessing, I had reached the conclusion, it will be remembered, that the extra baggage of my friend the artist would prove to be pictures, or at least a picture, for I knew he had been for several weeks in conference with Nicolino, and now here was a box which from its shape could possibly contain nothing in the world but a copy of Leonardo's Last Supper, and a copy of this very Last Supper done by Rubini the Younger at Florence, I had known for some time to be in the possession of Nicolino. This point, therefore, I considered as sufficiently settled. I chuckled excessively when I thought of my acumen. It was the first time I had ever known Wyatt to keep from me any of his artistical secrets. But here he evidently intended to steal a march upon me and smuggle a fine picture to New York under my very nose, expecting me to know nothing of the matter. 
I resolve to quiz him well now and hereafter. Sore throat. The box did not go into the extra stateroom. It was deposited in Wyatt's own, and there too it remained, occupying very nearly the whole of the floor. No doubt, to the exceeding discomfort of the artist and his wife, this the more especially as the tar or paint with which it was lettered in sprawling capitals emitted a strong disagreeable and to my fancy a peculiarly disgusting odor. On the lids were painted the words Mrs. Adelaide Curtis Albany, New York charge of Cornelius Wyatt Esquire this side up to be handled with care. Now I was aware that Mrs. Adelaide Curtis of Albany was the artist's wife's mother but then I looked upon the whole address as a mystification intended especially for myself. I made up my mind, of course, that the box and content, contents would never get farther north than the studio of my misanthric, misanthropic friend in Chambers Street, New York. For the first three or four days we had fine weather Although the wind was dead ahead, having chopped round to the northward, immediately upon our losing sight of the coast, the passengers were consequently in high spirits and dissolved and disposed to be social. I must accept, however, Wyatt and his sisters, who behaved stiffly, and I could not help thinking uncourteously to the rest of the party. Wyatt's conduct I did not so much regard. He was gloomy even, behind, even beyond his usual habit. In fact, he was morose. But in him I was prepared for eccentric. He was eccentric. Eccentric. For the sisters, however, I could make no excuse. They secluded themselves in their staterooms during the greater part of the passage and absolutely refused, although I repeatedly urged them to hold communication with any person on board. <clears throat> Mrs. Wyatt herself was far more agreeable. That is to say, she was chatty, and to be chatty is no slight recommendation at sea. She became excessively intimate with most of the ladies, and to my profound astonishment, Events no equivocal disposition to coquette with the men. She amused us all very much. I say amused with scarce and scarcely know how to explain myself. The truth is I soon found that Mrs. W. was far oftener laughed at than with. The gentleman said little about her, but the ladies in a little while pronounced her a good-hearted thing, rather indifferent-looking, totally uneducated, and decidedly vulgar. The great wonder was how Wyatt had been entrapped into such a match. Wealth was the general solution, but this I knew to be no solution at all, for Wyatt had told me that she neither brought him a dollar nor had any expectations from any source whatever. He had married, he said, for love and for love only, and his bride was far more worthy of his love. When I thought of these expressions on the part of my friend, I confess that I felt indescribably puzzled. Could it be possible he was taking leave of his senses? What else could I think? He, so refined, so intellectual, so fastidious, with so exquisite a perception of the faulty and so keen an appreciation of the beautiful, to be sure the lady seemed especially fond of him, particularly so in his absence when she made herself ridiculous by frequent 
quotations of what had been said by her beloved husband, Mr. Wyatt. The word husband seemed forever, to use one of her own delicate expressions, forever on the tip of her tongue. In the meantime, it was observed by all on board that he avoided her in the most pointed manner and for the most part shut himself up alone in his stateroom where, in fact, he might have been said to live altogether, leaving his wife at full liberty to amuse herself, as she thought best, in the public society of the main cabin. My conclusion from what I saw and heard was that the artist, by some unaccountable freak of fate, or perhaps in some fit of enthusiastic and fanciful passion, had been induced to unite himself with a person altogether beneath him, and that the natural result, entire and speedy disgust, had ensued. I pitied him from the bottom of my heart, but could not, for that reason, quite forgive his incommunicativeness and in the matter of the Last Supper. For this I resolved to have my revenge. One day he came upon deck, and taking his arm, as had been my wont, I sauntered with him backward and forward. His gloom, however, and, um, parentheses, which I considered quite natural under the circumstances, seemed entirely unabated. He said little, and that moodily, and with evident effort, I ventured a jest or two, and he made a sickening attempt at a smile. Poor fellow! As I thought of his wife, I wondered that he could have he could have heart to put on even the semblance of mirth. At last, I ventured a home thrust. I determined to commence a series of covert insinuations or innuendos about the oblong box, just to let him perceive gradually that I was not altogether the butt or victim of his little bit of pleasant mystification. My first observation was by way of opening a masked battery. I said something about the, pe the peculiar shape of that box, and as I spoke the words, I smiled knowingly, winked, and touched him gently with my forefinger in the ribs. The manner in which Wyatt received this harmless pleasantry convinced me at once that he was mad. At first he stared at me as if he found it impossible to comprehend the witticism of my remark, but as it's point seemed slowly to make its way into his brain, his eyes in the same proportion seemed protruding from their sockets. Then he grew very red, then hideously pale, then as if highly amused with what I had insinuated, he began a loud and boisterous laugh, which to my astonishment he kept up with gradually in increasing vigor for ten minutes or more. <clears throat> in, conclu yeah. in conclusion, he fell flat and heavily upon the deck. When I ran to uplift him to all appearance, he was dead. I called assistance, and with much difficulty, we brought him to himself. Upon reviving, he spoke incoherently for some time. At length, we bled him and put him to bed. Next morning, he was quite recovered so far as regarded his mere bodily health. Of his mind, I say nothing, of course. I avoided him during the rest of the passage by advice of the captain, who seemed to coincide with me altogether in my views of his insanity but cautioned me to say nothing on, his, on this head to any person on board. Several circumstances occurred immediately after this fit of Wyatt, which contributed to heighten the curiosity with which I already possessed. Among other things, 
this. I had been nervous, drank too much strong green tea, and slept ill at night. In fact, for two nights, I could not be properly said to sleep at all. Now, my stateroom opened into the main cabin or dining room, as did those of all the single men on board. Wyatt's three rooms were in the after cabin, which was separated from the main one by... <clears throat> Sorry, this post nasal drip is the pits. Ugh. Hmm. I had been, among other things, this. I had been nervous, drank too much strong green tea, and slept ill at night. In fact, for two nights I could not be properly said to sleep at all. Now my stateroom opened into the main cat. I just read that, didn't I? Sorry, I did read that. Okay, Wyatt's three rooms after cabin, which were separated from the main one by a slight sliding door, never locked, even at night. As we were almost constantly on a wind and the breeze was not a little stiff, the ship healed to leeward very considerably, and whenever her starboard side was to leeward, the sliding door between the cabins slid open, and so remained nobody taking the trouble to get up and shut it. But my berth was in such a position that when my own stateroom door was open, as well as the sliding door in question, and my own door was always open on account of the heat, I could see into the after cabin quite distinctly, and just at that portion of it, too, where we were situated, the staterooms of Mr. Wyatt. Well, during two nights, and in parentheses, not consecutive, while I lay awake, I clearly saw Mrs. W. about eleven o'clock upon each night steal cautiously from the stateroom of Mr. W. and enter the extra room where she remained until daybreak. When she was called by her husband and went back. Uh, that they were virtually separated was clear. They had separate apartments, no doubt in contemplation of a more permanent divorce. And here, after all I thought was the mystery of the extra stateroom, there was another circumstance, too, which interested me much. During the two wakeful nights in question and immediately after the disappearance of Mrs. Wyatt into the extra stateroom, I was attracted by certain singular, cautious, subdued noises in that of her husband. After listening to them for some time with thoughtful attention, I at length succeeded perfectly in translating their import. They were sounds occasioned by the artist in prying open the oblong box by means of a chisel and mallet the latter being apparently muffled or deadened by some soft woolen or cotton substance in which its head was enveloped. <clears throat> in this manner, I fancied I could distinguish the precise, precise moment when he fairly disengaged the lid also that I could determine when he removed it altogether, and when he deposited it upon the lower berth in his room. This latter point I knew, for example, by certain slight taps, which the lid made in striking against the wooden edges of the berth, berth as he endeavored to lay it down very gently, there being no room for it on the floor. After this, there was a dead stillness, and I heard nothing more upon either occasion until nearly daybreak, 
unless perhaps I may mention a low sobbing or murmuring sound so very much suppressed as to be nearly inaudible. Indeed, if, indeed, the whole of this latter noise were not rather produced by my own imagination, I say it seemed to resemble sobbing or sighing, but of course it could have been either, could not have been either. I rather think it was a ringing in my own ears. Mr. Wyatt, no doubt, according to custom, was merely given the rein to one of his hobbies indulging in one of his fits of artistic enthusiasm. He had opened the oblong box in order to feast his eyes on the pictorial treasure within. There was nothing in this, however, to make him S.O.B. I repeat, therefore, that it must have been simply a freak of my own fancy distempered by good Captain Hardy's green tea. <laughs> Just before dawn on each of the two nights of which I speak, I distinctly heard Mr. Wyatt replace the lid upon the oblong box and force the nails into their old places by means of the muffled mallet. Having done this, he issued from his stateroom fully dressed, and proceeded to call Mrs. W. from hers. We had been at sea seven days and were now off to Cape Hatteras. Off, excuse me, off Cape Hatteras. So this is in my neck of the woods. Well, Charleston. Between Charleston and Cape Hatteras. When there came a tremendously heavy blow from the southwest, we were in measure, prepared for it, however, as the weather had been holding out threats for some time. Everything was made snug, a low, and aloft, and as the wind steadily freshened, we lay too at length under spanker and fore, fore topsail, both double reefed. In this trim, we rode safely enough for 48 hours, the ship proving herself an excellent sea boat in many respects and shipping no water of any consequence. At the end of this period, however, the gale had freshened into a hurricane, and our after sail split into ribbons, bringing us so much in the trough of the water that we shipped several prodi prodigious seas, one immediately after the other. By this accident, we lost three men overboard with the caboose and nearly the whole of the larboard bulwarks. Scarcely had we recovered our senses before the fore topsail went into shreds. When we got up a storm stay sail with this and with this did pretty well for some hours, the ship heading the sea much more steadily than before. The gale still held on, however, and we saw no signs of its abating. The rigging was found to be ill-fitted and greatly strained, and on the third day of the blow, about five in the afternoon, our mizzen mast in a heavy lurch to windward went by the board for an hour or more we tried in vain to get rid of it on account of the prodigious rolling of the ship and before we had succeeded the carpenter came aft and announced four feet of water in the hold to add to our dilemma we found the pumps choked and nearly useless all was now confusion and despair, but an effort was made to lighten the ship by throwing overboard as much of her cargo as could be reached, and by cutting away the two masts that remained. This we at last accomplished, but we were still unable to do anything at the pumps, and in the meantime the leak gained on us very fast. <clears throat> Mm. 
At sundown, the gale had sensibly diminished in violence. And as the sea went down with it, <clears throat> excuse me, we still entertained faint hopes of saving ourselves in the boats. At 8 p.m., the clouds broke away to windward and we had the advantage of a full moon. A piece of good fortune which served wonderfully to cheer our drooping spirits. After incredible labor, we succeeded at length in getting the longboat over the side without material accident, and into this we crowded the whole of the crew and most of the passengers. This party made off immediately. <coughs> Crew's getting out of here. And after undergoing much suffering, finally arrived in safety at Ocracoke Inlet on the third day after the wreck. Fourteen passengers with the captain remained on board, resolving to trust their fortunes to the jolly boat at the stern. We lowered it without difficulty, although it was only by a miracle that we prevented it from swamping as it touched the water. It contained, when afloat, the captain and his wife, Mrs. Wyatt and party, a Mexican officer, wife, four children, and myself, with a valet. We had no room, of course, for anything except a few positively necessary instruments, some provision, provisions, and the clothes upon our backs. No one had thought of even attempting to save anything more. What must have been the astonishment of all then when having proceeded a few fathoms from the ship, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Wyatt stood up in the stern sheets and coolly demanded of Captain Hardy that the boat should be put back for the purpose of taking in his oblong box. Sit down, Mr. Wyatt, replied the captain somewhat sternly. You will capsize us if you do not sit sit quite still. Our gunwale is almost in the water now. The box, vociferated Mr. Wyatt, still standing. The box, I say, Captain Hardy, you cannot, you will not refuse me. Its weight will be but a trifle. It is nothing, mere nothing, but... No, mere nothing. By the mother who bore you for the love of heaven, by your hope of salvation, I implore you to put back for the box. The captain for a moment seemed touched by the earnest appeal of the artist, but he regained his stern composure and merely said... Mr. Wyatt, you are mad. I cannot listen to you. Sit down, I say, or you will swamp the boat. Stay. Hold him. Seize him. He's about to spring overboard. There. I knew it. He is over. As the captain said this, Mr. Wyatt, in fact, sprang from the boat. And as we were yet in the lee of the wreck, succeeded by almost superhuman exertion, and getting hold of a rope which hung from the fore chains. In another moment, he was on board and rushing frantically down into the cabin. In the meantime, we had been swept astern of the ship, and being quite out of her lee, were at the mercy of the tremendous sea which was still running. We made a determined effort to put back, but our little boat was like a feather in the breath, breath of the tempest. We saw at a glance that the doom of the unfortunate art artist was sealed. As our distance from the wreck rapidly increased, the madman, in parentheses, for as such only could we regard him, was seen to emerge from the companion way up which, by dint of strength that appeared gigantic, he dragged bodily the oblong box. 
While we gazed in the extremity of astonishment, he passed rapidly several turns of a three-inch rope, first around the box and then around his body. In another instant, both body and box were in the sea, disappearing suddenly at once and forever. <clears throat> We lingered a while, sadly upon our oars, with our eyes riveted upon the spot. At length we pulled away. The silence remained unbroken for an hour. Finally, I haphazarded a remark. No, I hazarded. <laughs> I hazarded a remark. Did you observe? Yeah. Did you observe, Captain, how suddenly they sank? Was not that an exceedingly singular thing? I confess that I entertained some feeble hope of his final deliverance. When I saw him lash when I saw him lash himself to the box and commit himself to the sea. They sank as a matter of course, replied the captain, and that like a shot. They will soon rise again, however, but not till the salt melts. The salt, I ejaculated. Hush, said the captain, pointing to the wife and sisters of the deceased. We must talk of these things at some more appropriate time. We suffered much and made a narrow escape, but fortune befriended us, as well as our mates in the longboat. We landed in fine more dead than alive after four days of intense distress upan the beach opposite Roanoke Island. We remained here a week, were not ill treated by the wreckers, and at length obtained a passage to New York. About a month after the loss of the independence I happened to meet Captain Hardy in Broadway. Our conversation turned naturally upon the disaster and especially upon the sad fate of poor Wyatt. I thus learned the following particulars. The artist had engaged passage for himself, wife, two sisters, and a servant. His wife was indeed, as she had been represented, a most lovely and most accomplished woman. On the morning of the 14th of June, and in parentheses it said, the day in which I first visited the ship, the lady suddenly sickened and died. <clears throat> the young husband was frantic with grief, but circumstances imperatively forbade the deferring his voyage to New York. It was necessary to take to her mother the corpse of his adored wife, and on the other hand, the universal prejudice which one, which would prevent his doing so openly was well known. Nine-tenths of the passengers would have abandoned the ship rather than take passage with a dead body. In this dilemma, Captain Hardy arranged that the corpse, being first particularly embalmed and packed with a large quantity of salt in a box of suitable dimensions, should be conveyed on board as merchandise. Nothing was to be said of the lady's decease, and as it was well understood that Mr. Wyatt had engaged passage for his wife, it became necessary that some person should... Uh, wait a minute. I was <clears throat> Lordy, lordy. About done. Merchandise, nothing is better. 
An engaged passage for his wife, it became necessary that some person should personate personate her during the voyage. This the deceased lady's maid was easily prevailed on to do. So it was her maid that was pretending to be her. I guess is what they're saying, right? Uh, the extra stateroom originally engaged for this girl during her mistress's life was now merely retained in the stateroom the pseudo-wife <laughs> slept, of course, every night. In the daytime, she performed to the best of her ability the part of her mistress, whose person it had been carefully ascertained was unknown to any of the passengers on board. Last paragraph. My own mistake arose, naturally enough, through too careless, too inquisitive, and too impulsive a temperament. But of late, it is a rare thing that I sleep soundly at night. There is a countenance which haunts me, turn as I will. There is a hysterical laugh which will forever ring within my ears. And that is all. That is that. I guess that was a sample, so I don't know if that's exactly all of it or not. So that's that. I'm sorry, I'm just getting back to. Something here. I'm going to let y'all go. Good night. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Love y'all. Bye-bye.